On January 6th, I received a text message from my sister April asking me if I saw what was happening. I didn't know what she was talking about, so I immediately pulled up the news on my computer and watched in horror as our democracy was experiencing an attack by white nationalists. Immediately, I asked myself, how did we get here? As I sat with this question, watching the absurd images on my screen, contemplating, I felt the familiar pangs of shame. I realized shame was present because I knew very well how we got here. I saw that my original question really should have been, why are we still here? I've heard so many, mostly white leaders, from various political frames calling for unity. I hear them wanting a unity that is quick and shallow. They often use various permutations of the phrase, this is not who we are. And I must admit that every time I hear that phrase, a smoldering rage under my skin burns. I feel my heart scream inside, no, this is who we are, but it doesn't have to be. In 1993, I was an undergraduate at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, taking a course called Rhetoric of Race Relations. It was taught by Dr. Keith Jenkins, the first Black teacher ever to teach me anything. I was 22 years old. Just think about that for a moment. It means that for 21 years of my life, all of the instruction, all of my education, any life lessons provided to me were provided by white men and women only. This class was the first time that I learned about a United States of America that I simply didn't know existed before. I remember being taken through the arrival of the first colonists to the North America and their intentions on claiming the land and converting the inhabitants to a more civilized way of Christian living. I recall hearing about the overwhelming expectation that everything seen was God-given for their taking, a colonial mindset based in the doctrine of discovery. This belief structure resulted in Western expansion and disease transmission that would decimate so many Native peoples. I also learned of the Trail of Tears, the forcible removal of five independent nations from the eastern parts of the United States to the then barren and unwelcoming parts of what is now Oklahoma a cruel assertion of white Christian supremacy culture ordered by then U.S. President Andrew Jackson. This is who we are, but it doesn't have to be. In our class, we proceeded from the genocide of the Native peoples of this land to review the treatment of Black Americans from their first enslavement in this nation forward in time. We read the writings of Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois. I learned about abolitionist Isabella Bomfrey, who took on the Christian name Sojourner Truth, and journalist Ida B. Wells. It was also the first time I had ever read anything by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., specifically his letter from Birmingham Jail. We studied the major court cases in our nation's history that further stripped humanity from enslaved Black folk and learned of court cases in our history that also attempted to rectify some of the past atrocities. We discussed that even after the removal of the Jim Crow laws from society, our nation enacted the war on drugs, which led to the over-incarceration of Black men and women disenfranchising them from voting if they had been convicted of felonies. This is who we are, but it doesn't have to be. Honestly, we don't even have to look back in our nation's history to see the rearings and the legacy of white supremacy culture alive and well. Just last week, we witnessed a pitiful display of police response to a violent attack on our democracy, 
unlike the overwhelming police response experienced and witnessed by many of us during the first amendment protected Black Lives Matter protests of this past summer. The images of the differences between these occurrences is striking and is clear and present evidence of white supremacy culture alive and well in our democracy today. This is who we are, but it doesn't have to be. Our Unitarian Universalist values stress the importance of honoring the spark of divinity in all of us, recognizing the deep interconnectedness and upholding the democratic process and ideals through our covenantal practices. It is in our covenants that love takes shape. Covenants are where we work to bound behaviors that damage the human family. After all, love without boundaries isn't love at all. I believe our covenantal faith movement is uniquely poised to assist in the healing of our communities, our country, and the greater world. But this cannot happen until every person in this country has educated themselves and embraced their part in upholding the systems of white supremacy culture. This horrible culture contributes to emboldening of groups of white people, like we saw on January 6th. Groups of white people who are so unafraid of accountability that they would violently enter our Capitol building, smear excrement on its walls, take selfies with law enforcement agents while committing felonious acts. I believe we are all being called at this time to name white supremacy culture and to work with our marginalized siblings to dismantle it so that the sins of our past that have given rise to our faulty institutions can truly be transformed into a more perfect union. This is who we are, but it doesn't have to be. In an article published in The Atlantic this week, author and educator Dr. Ibram X. Kendi says, And in the end, what will make America true is the willingness of the American people to stare at their national face for the first time, to open the book of their history for the first time, and see themselves for themselves, all the political viciousness, all the political beauty, and finally right the wrongs, or spend the rest of the life of America trying. As we honor the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. today, Dr. Kendi's words take me back into the classroom of my younger days, where I opened the book of U.S. history for the first time back to my rhetoric of race relations class and Dr. Keith Jenkins. I remember our class reading collectively the letter from Birmingham jail. So many important ideals can be found in that letter. This year, I am most touched by Dr. King's following words. Lamentably, it is in a historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But, as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. May we Unitarian Universalists continue to work on dismantling our own internal white supremacy culture and also be builders of a moral collective ready to relinquish institutional power and build a more diverse and inclusive beloved community. Amen, ashe, and blessed be.